Sufism Part 3 In existence of the scheme of God, nothing happens without a reason. It is our ignorance that we cannot see the broader picture of things to happen. Our vision is very limited. We cannot see beyond time and space. That's why we are conditioned by pain and pleasure. When these words are spoken, first they are invisible because they are formed in the mind of the person who is speaking. Therefore, the essence of the word is invisible. From the word comes sound and sound is energy, so word is energy as well. Sound too is energy, however the form is different. When word is spoken, it is analog. As the word is spoken, its form changes. Analog sound has another form. In that form, it cannot travel. It is in digital waveform that sound travels and remains the part of this cosmos. And it is your hearing device, be it mechanical or your eardrums that has the capability to convert the digital sound waves into analog and the word reaches you. Word in the form of sound creates vibrations. Each word, good or bad, follows the same process. Both have effect. These create echoes that vibrate your body, mind and intellect. So word creates an action and like a shadow these words and their echo follows us. With light of awakening all shadows and echoes vanish and then everything, word, sound, is understood in its true essence and that creates an undisturbed silence. Indeed, it is the ignorance of the man, ignorance of the man, that leads him to pain or states of pleasure and this leads to destruction and avoid the possibility of any awakening. He has not yet discovered the middle way, just like the tightrope walker. He leans to this side and that side, only to remain in the middle, so that his balance is not disturbed and he does not lean permanently to the left or to the right. This is the essence of meditation to remain in the middle, so neither of the two extremes can ever disturb you. The two extremes are always dualistic and they continue to pull us to their side and it becomes the cause of pain or pleasure. An existence does its work itself according to the level of awakening and inner growth you become the cause and instrument in the work of the existence. Therefore, it is very important that we strive to remain in the middle, that neither pain nor pleasure, neither good nor bad, neither heat or cold disturbs us. You will know there are many pairs of opposite. Either we lean towards this too much or towards that too much. And that becomes cause of our pain and suffering. And 
when it becomes the cause of our suffering, then we find it is very difficult to come out of that. Therefore, before you can become capable of understanding the words of the Master or capable of looking into the eyes of God, you will have to become capable of looking into the eyes of the Master. If you want to look at the sun, you have to begin the practice by looking at the candlelight. Its intensity is much less. When you can continuously look at the candle without blinking, then slowly and slowly you develop the capability to look at the sun without blinking and your eyes get fixed. Normally the blinking of the eyes and movement of thoughts is interconnected. When there are thoughts in the mind, the eyes continue to blink. Even sometimes you sit down by the side of a person, rest assured that everyone dreams. And when a person is dreaming, the eyes continue to move. And from that you know the person has gone into a dream state. And there in the dream state, there is formation of thoughts. So whenever there is thoughts or continuously thoughts are plaguing your inner sky, there will be movement of the eyes. Movement of the eyes means it is the iris that continues to move and it does not get fixed. When a person dies and you look at him, his iris does not move, it is fixed. So sometimes when we see a situation like this, we get frightened and then we close the eyes of the person so that we do not look at the eyes of that person. This always happens. The moment we find a person is dead, his eyes becomes fixed, the iris does not move. When a person attains to meditation, there is least movement in the iris. And this is indicative that thoughts do not arise unwanted in that person and then you will be able to look into the eyes of the Master. And when you are capable of looking into the eyes of the Master, then one day you can look into the eyes of the whole, the existence that you call as God. The, your journey has to begin from where you are. From there you take off, the journey begins. Master is the one who, is, who looks like you, he talks and walks like you. Yet still there is something of the beyond lurking through his very presence. He is soaked in godliness, he is overflowing the blissfulness. And in that state whatever he says, transforms you, becomes the panacea, becomes the medicine. It is the miracle of the unknown, beyond time and space a continuum. I am making myself available to you. Sufism is just an excuse. I will not be talking about Sufism. I will be talking Sufism itself. I am not talking about. There is a vast difference between talking about something and talking something. The word Sufism is also beautiful. It has many orientations and all are beautiful. I would not like to emphasize any specific orientation. A few people choose one orientation while others choose another. However, my understanding is that 
all those orientations are beautiful and have something special to convey. I accept them all. Each orientation speaks of the inner state of the one who is expressing this. One Nakshbandi Sheikh, Hazrat Abul Hasan Kharkani Raziyallah Ta'ala Unu, said, Sufism was once a reality without a name, and now Sufism is a name without reality. For many centuries, Sufism existed without a name. It existed as reality only. That is why I say Jesus was a Sufi, so was Muhammad, so was Mahabi, and so was Krishna. Anyone who has come to know God, come to be God, is indeed a Sufi. Why do I say so? Try to understand the word Sufi and it, it will become clear to you. The word Sufi is a new coinage. It is of German origin. It emerged out of German scholarship. It is not more than 150 years old. In Arabic, the word is Tasabu. But both came from the root Suf, which means wool. It is very strange why should wool become the symbol of Sufism. The scholars go on saying that it is because Sufis used to wear woolen robes. That is true. But why? Nobody has answered this. Why should they be wearing woolen robes? Holy Prophet Hazrata Pahamba Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in Holy Quran, even Moses was wearing a woolen robe when he encountered God. When God spoke to him, he was entirely in a woolen robe. But why? There is a deep symbolism in it. The symbolism is that wool is the garb of the animal and a Sufi has to become as innocent as an animal. The Sufi has to attain to primal innocence. He has to drop all kinds of civilizations, all kinds of cultures and all kinds of conditionings and thus has to become again innocent like an animal, then the symbol becomes tremendously significant. When man becomes animal, it does not mean he has fallen back as is normally conceived. Instead he goes higher. When man becomes animal, he is not just an animal. That is not possible. You have not regressed. You cannot fall back. When a man becomes an animal, he becomes a saint. He becomes innocent. By becoming an animal is his conscious choice. He remains conscious, but his consciousness is no more burdened by any conditioning. He is no more a Hindu, no more a Mohammedan and no more Christian. He is in tune with existence as deeply as any animal. He has dropped all kinds of philosophies. No more conceptualization in his mind. Mind is without any content. He is, but he is no more in the mind. To be the, like innocent animals, is the very meaning of the woolen robe. He is no more in the duality of what is good and what is bad. Only then the highest good, the absolute good arises. This is Samam Banam, the ultimate good. When you know this good and that is bad, and you choose good against bad, and you remain divided. This is duality. When you choose, there is repression. 
you choose one and repress the other. Regret, you choose one and reject the other. This leads to repression. When you say, I will do this, this has to be done, this should be done, this becomes an ought. Then naturally you have to repress. You have to repress that which you have condemned as bad and the repressed part remains inside you and goes on poisoning your system and sooner or later it will assert itself. Sooner or later it will take revenge. When it explodes, it will surface even without your knowing. You will go mad. Look at the situation that comes around you. Whenever there is a conflict or brawl happens in the family or otherwise, it is always try to reflect back on the words that are spoken. Many things are spoken at that time which have nothing to do with the particular context at that moment. We start digging up the past griefs. I have heard a beautiful conversation. Trinidadians, for that matter, everyone has his own dialect of speaking. His own dialect of speaking. When you look at, when you hear an Australian speaking, he has his way. When you listen to an American or specifically New, New Yorkian, he speaks in a specific way. Indians, Trinidadians, everyone speak in their own way. So this conversation was between two friends who were Trinidadians. So one of them said, when my wife gets angry, she becomes historical. So the other said in Trini tone, yeah, yeah, die true. My wife also gets historical when she gets vexed. So a white man who was standing there, who was a friend, he said, my friends, the word is not historical, it is hysterical. So the Trini friend said in his own tune, you anno, you anno, only a Trinidadian can understand means you do not know. My uh, wife, may they do not say my, my wife gets historical and dies the way, and that is the way. So then the white man said, explain to me why you are using the word historical. He said, when she gets angry, she becomes historical by that I mean she starts bringing out all those past things which are no more there. Such is the situation of each one of us, of a human mind. We bring out those things which has no relevance to the particular conversation. Your wife had asked you to bring something for a specific occasion because some guests are coming or there is an occasion for prayers, anything. You go to the marketplace, get the things. On the way, you get an important call and you forget, you come back home empty-handed. You forget what you had been sent. When you reach home, your wife will say, I know you cannot do things properly. The last time when we had the prayers and I asked you to go and get this thing, you come back two hours after the prayer finish and that's how you go. That particular thing was not necessary at that time, but the human mind is human mind and we are yoked to it. Whenever a situation like this, reflect back on this particular message that, or this example that I have given to you. Slowly and slowly you will realize that you can come out of this situation.